got indie filmmaker and columnist and former policeman Jack Bennett on the show. Former policeman. I used to work for the police, but I was always a civilian. But that's actually that's that's pretty interesting that you bring that up. The columnist part, I definitely contribute a lot of interviews yep. and articles and things like that throughout so the many. years. <laughs> well, but that's but that's the weird part too, is that a lot of it was online and that was like two generations of a lot of those companies ago. Like before Corey bought Famous Monsters and before the current owners of Fangoria. It's like in both of those cases, that's Two owners ago, two completely different staffs ago. So <laughs> redistributing, re. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think some of that stuff you can't find. Like I have PDFs of everything, but I think a lot of it you can't find. I don't think you can find my eulogy to uh, Dan O'Bannon. Um, but then a version of that got printed in a book that I, I wrote an essay for, uh, my favorite horror movie, that a uh, a, a yeah a producer named Christian Ackerman, a, a film producer. Uh, edited and produced a series of books called My Favorite Horror Movie, and he basically got all the creators he knows to contribute a chapter. And it wasn't <laughs> even necessarily this is my favorite horror movie because some people actually got real, uh, real strange with it and nice. just pick some. You know what I mean? Like they picked something and be like, "Well, I'm going to pretend this is my favorite horror movie and really make a case for it." I picked Return of the Living Dead, and it was for the most part a reprint of a eulogy I wrote for Dan O'Bannon when he passed away. That got posted on Fangoria.com, and uh, and I sort of blew it out a little bit. But I remember when I talked to Diana Bannon about it, she was like, "Oh yeah, I remember that." So at least <laughs> at least she saw it. But um, yeah, that was you got some that, feedback. <laughs> I got some good feedback. They they used to encourage us on Fangoria.com to engage with the fans. But what that meant was, if someone makes a shitty comment, you make a shitty comment back. <laughs> And I was encouraged <laughs> to do that. And I made some enemies who became friends many times on that. Because it would be enemies in the comments and then friends in the direct messages. <laughs> By the way, can we curse? I just realized I dropped it. Fuck, 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 you fuck. There you go. Cheers. Your <laughs> grasp of language is admirable. <laughs> so intelligent, I know. <laughs> oh, man. So... I figured I'd have you on a two-parter uh, just to talk about. Uh, we we introduced you in like two different specials, and tonight we're we're talking about the RoboCop villains. There's been all uh, kinds of jokes, including how many of them have been on Twin Peaks and Star Trek. Uh, most oh, of them yeah. were all seasonal villains, yeah, or opposing forces on the show Twenty Four, because so there's a lot of crossover there. Um, a lot of times look to the casting directors because you start to realize you start to say things like, why does a guy from Better Call Saul show up on the new Twin Peaks? And the mm -hmm. answer is, you know, same casting director. So a lot of it's that. But I also think David Lynch is a big B movie fan. Oh, absolutely. Would, yeah. It's like some of the people that he would cast, you know, the, you know, Ben Van Horn and, and um, you know, Russ Tamblin uh, uh, being from, uh, West Side Story aside, then you know you've got David Patrick Kelly and and uh, oh for fuck's sake, I'm so sorry. I just want to make sure I get these guys' names right. <laughs> yeah, David Patrick Kelly and uh, the guy who played Connell Cochran um, was that. Uh, um, I think it was Miguel Ferrar. I think Miguel Ferrer also. That yeah, it's so. The guy played Colin Cochran in Halloween 3, who's also the old man in RoboCop. And he's on Twin Peaks. Oh, so. O'Hurley. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there you go. O'Hurley. There you go. And uh, and then you got Miguel Ferrer, of course, mm -hmm. uh, MVP of Twin Peaks. And I would argue one of the one of the contending MVPs from RoboCop. But would you consider Miguel Ferrer's character a, a villain? He's sort I, of the... Yeah. More like a fall guy. Kind of like just someone who is just... Hey, uh, look at him like one of the henchmen in Die Hard, where he's not trying to fuck things up, but he's still a merc and directly helping. Yeah, he's on the wrong side, and he's definitely a shark. He's, he's like aggressive. Ellis and Die Hard, actually. He's yeah. like Ellis and Die Hard, but <laughs> there is a there is a character in RoboCop Two who should just have tattooed on his forehead. We never should have killed Miguel Ferrer. I think what had happened was. <laughs> Miguel Ferrer was cast to play the Ellis and Die Hard, you know, cannon fodder character. And he's so good. 
he's so good. You watch that movie, his choices are so incredible that it becomes like the character elevates past who's supposed to be the big bad in the first place, right. which is Ronnie Cox. Mm-hmm. But, but when I think of RoboCop and I think of villains, I think of Kurt Wood Smith. I think of Clarence La, 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 blam. And all of the things about that performance, I don't, I, Paul Verhoeven and actors, I kind of, I don't have a sense of the approach, but I do feel like Verhoeven is a bit of that. Um, he's got a streak of that Ken Russell sort of enfant trebe kind of, I don't mean in his actions, but I mean more right. the, the chaos and the creation and the throwing and the, you know, throwing the art, artistry into, let's face it. The great thing about RoboCop is that it's an, it's a, uh, it's a two level movie. It's like two lines that are parallel to each other that work in tandem. And those two levels are, it's a Christ allegory that's a satire on the military industrial complex. That's a, a social criticism of the way that people vote against their own interests and mm-hmm. the way in which corporations have taken the place of citizens in terms of importance. And, and it's all of those things. And it's got an elegance and a deep, deep socially critical edge to it. Also, it's that movie where that robot cop shoots a guy in the dick. Yeah, well, and going back to B movie, I mean, Verhoeven, yeah. much like Cronenberg and right, uh, so many others, Romero, he just uses yeah. his format to create a bigger picture, and so yeah, Wes Craven I'm, certainly was Wes Craven, a well, and a guy who of, took the language of horror to make statements about humanity, you know, absolutely, and a lot of people are. It's kind of almost a Star Wars Terminator thing where people are you know blown away by the dialogue the action and everything but it's pretty clear who's actually looking at it deeper you know as you know film buffs like us who've seen it a million times and realize okay it's well it's not it's not it's no slouch there's plenty of material that is bigger than you know it doesn't have it's not asking to win awards but it is also it's not a one-trick pony it's very deep this whole world and I hear that, and I and the thing that I love about it that I think makes those movies what they are, is that they can simultaneously be art and uh, cheap seat entertainment. Mm-hmm. They don't like you don't have to have a college degree in critical analysis to watch that movie and enjoy it. But if Bingo. you do, you can watch that movie and enjoy it. It's a movie that is it doesn't insult your intelligence while giving you all the requisite thrills. That's why a movie like that, and that's why you know some of the John Carpenter movies and the David Cronenberg movies and the Romero movies, like at their best, these are movies that are in no way attempting to be mainstream palatable. And Bingo. yet there is, and yet there is artistry to them. And, and it, it, yeah, either it, version had so much working against it. You know, it's a miracle 100%. any of these movies have been made, and much like. Neo in the Matrix, I was kind of cool with what they did with Robocop because I mean, you yeah. see the worst thing that could possibly happen to him happen at the beginning act. He gets his ass kicked, mm-hmm. he's rehabilitated. And so you're like, see, but now I'm already ready for his line because this isn't taking this, this move, either movie already sets you up for this is not going to be an easy way out for this protagonist. Yeah, Joseph Campbell, did you say? Did, is that what I heard? <laughs> he, the he's heroes, calling. What? He wants some residuals. <laughs> <laughs> the hero's what? The what's journey? Um, yeah, and that ability for those movies to have sort of art in the corners. And and uh, there's, um, I've quoted him a lot lately, just as I've been developing my own stuff, but there's a very, very nice guy who's a very successful producer named Craig Perry, who's out here in LA, and he produced- Hi, Craig. The, yeah, hi, Greg. And he produced the Final Destination movies, and he also produced the American Pie movies. And I went to a screening of one of the the last Final Destination movie, the, uh, <laughs> or the most recent one, I must Probably say. Probably part five, yeah. I think. Yeah. That was yeah. Final Destination. The five. bridge scene. Yeah. That's... Well, what I was really interested in was the way in which it was almost subtle. The way in which the the fifth movie loops around into the series. Mm-hmm. In such a way that if you hadn't seen the first Final Destination, you would have missed it. 
but that doesn't take away from the effect of what you're watching. There's people in there who are like, oh my God, I almost died again. And it doesn't make sense unless you've seen one of the earlier ones. Yeah. But that's the thing. And that's what, what Craig said is that it actually does make sense to someone who hasn't seen the other movies. It works on its own. But if you know the other movies, it ties into them, mm -hmm. which is, I asked him, I was like, where do you find the barometer on that? We were just, you know, chatting after the movie. And I said, where do you find the line for that? And he said, put all your fan service at a frequency that only dogs can hear. And nice. right. And what I took from that is um, make sure that what you're doing is working on the level that it would work on, like working on an emotionally resonant level where it's as entertaining and as impactful if you haven't seen the other movie or you don't understand the reference. However, if someone gets the reference, it expands the whole thing for you. I'm looking it at makes... him now. Holy shit. He's been with the whole franchise as well as American Pie. I'm like, man. He, and couldn't happen to a nicer guy. He's a great dude. But that whole, but that whole idea of the movies that work on different levels, like the ending shot of RoboCop makes me cry. I love it so much. What's your name, son? And he says, Murphy, in that very, he, like, and he smiles. And then the movie says, Robocop. Yeah. <laughs> it's the perfect kind of one up. It's like yeah, the yeah. filmmakers are both, you know, giving you a happy meal and then telling you, fuck you behind your back at the same time. Like, it's just, it's a yeah. perfect for a satirical film. And it's like, give the audience gratitude. And then the ones who, like us, who've seen it a million times are like, I see what they did there. He still doesn't realize his life is a lie, even though he's survived now and into yeah. the villains. That's a cynical view of it, and which I don't think is wrong because it's such a black, blackly <laughs> comic movie. It's an insane there's movie. A, but there's another view of it, which is the robot is claiming his humanity. Mm -hmm. You know, he's and he's he's a human being at his core. He's not a robot. He's a cyborg. He has he has human memories. He has maybe even feelings, which is where that little smile comes. Absolutely. In. Uh, well, you'll, you'll love this. The TV show got edited together into a Rift Tracks feature recently. <laughs> <laughs> they just took some clips and decided to add their commentary to it. I'm going to check oh it out. God. Was uh, it Prime but, Directive or was it was it like no, a no, no, the, the the 90s TV show that filled yeah, separated yeah. itself from any other procedural at the time. It was just basically I don't, just yeah. I but I, I'm glad you brought up Prime Directive. Uh, I'm yeah. actually a fan of Bone Machine, despite. Dry sure. Wine Davies from Cube 2 and Forever Night really hamming it up. Uh, the yeah, Albert yeah. Bixler character, I think, is just interesting because it's kind of almost like Kane, who I think is kind of one of the few highlights in Part 2. Where... Well, and, all, and all the effects, like all the Phil Tippett yeah, stop motion. Yeah, absolutely. Can yeah. Robo Kane was cool as a Paul Tippett creation and just kind of how Phil, he's... Yeah, uh, Phil Tippett, yeah. Yeah, a reimagined Phil Tippett created a uh, cyborg character with only a human brain. And here I like how this guy, right. he's kind of reminds me of kind of a Dennis Hopper and speed kind of guy, just, <laughs> just ex cop, real shit bag. And just, you know, yeah. somehow he found out how to use his resources. If you can get past some of the questionable art direction, I think that that shows just due for a rewatch, just cause it's a very laid back, just Sunday night excitement. I, I would have rather the franchise gone that way versus Sure. Well, so, it, it got more comic booky, right? It got it. Yeah, because, and and then it became a really awesome comic. That's the other exactly, thing. exactly. Like I think that's why Frank Miller wrote the. I think he wrote the third movie too. He definitely wrote the second mm -hmm. one. And um, uh, but at least he got to recreate his vision in comic book form. But isn't it ironic sure. though how he doesn't always seem to be in on the joke, given his latest radical yeah. comments, which is so funny because RoboCop is totally stating about all the you know. Yeah, How, Robo, RoboCop's in on the joke. Even the, even the remake with Jackie Earl Haley as the right hand, yeah. Maddox, and Mike, Michael Keaton as the main baddie, uh, they're pretty much a Blackwater company. But Yeah, it's still it's finding the equivalent of the original movie rather than just kind of recycling the original movie. I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't really a fan, but I can see the nobility in taking the premise and what was sort of being being uh, uh, informed by Iran-Contra and Reaganomics and all that kind of stuff when they made the original RoboCop, mm -hmm. then how do we apply that to Afghanistan, Iraq, and like you said, Blackwater, and all that kind of stuff. is There's a nobility there, but I do remember very much so an episode of Harmontown, 
where Dan Harmon was <laughs> railing against the idea of remaking RoboCop. And part of what he was saying was the whole point of RoboCop is you don't expect it to be good. You expect <laughs> it to be some dumb movie about a robot Stupid cop. Stupid Terminator knockoff. And it and, <laughs> yep. And then, and they probably even produced it thinking that too. They really like, were. And yeah, Ryan not Ed Pitchers Neumeier. was like, whatever, man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the guy, like John Davison, Ed Newmeyer, Paul Verhoeven, like the, and, and, um, oh, and the other writer who I, I'm Michael something. I'm blanking on his name. Michael Miner. Yeah. Michael Miner, there you go. Those He's a minor guys... part of the picture, ironically. He hasn't really done much. <laughs> I don't know why. I'm like, it seems like he has a voice. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, and I think that he actually is responsible for a lot of what's good about Robocop too, uh, as well. Like, I don't I don't think that he was a minor figure then. Oh, totally. Ed Numenar, I yeah. wish, would do more, too. I mean, oh yeah. and so let, let me riddle you this. Ed's I'm trying. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, so this is clearly part of the Valverde saga as part of the Terminator connection. Um, mm. I don't know if you ever heard of that universe. Oh yeah, of course. Okay, yeah. Val so, for those who don't know and who are tired of me talking about it, maybe right in. Means maybe Green I'll... Val. <laughs> yeah, it, it's already a plot hole in terms of the country, but yeah, it's the yep. country from Predator, Die Hard Two, and Commando, and it's so funny. It's awesome all the connections you can make to Blade Runner, uh, all the other Alien and Predator, as well as Battlestar Galactica, even. Yeah. Sure. But, commando yep that's where it first appeared uh but so do you feel mm. uh given uh the verhoven numenar connection that yeah. total recall is somehow tied in with blade runner but do you feel like starship troopers is part of this verse as well with the corporations oh, uh, or visuals man. i think it's more likely <laughs> the Blade Runner alien connection. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, but that being said, this is a bigger spoof movie. you know. Yeah. But I, I'm also basing that just on production design and Prometheus. Um, I think that you could absolutely go down that rabbit hole and you would drive yourself crazy because how I'm already crazy. So it just right. makes me crazier. <laughs> how does RoboCop exist in the same universe as predator? You know what I mean? It's like there's you can imagine that universe and that would be awesome, but it's a little bit like when they make these superhero movies, they're all interconnected, and then it becomes like, why is Superman not intervening on this thing if the world is at stake? And they always yeah. have to explain like, oh, Superman's somewhere else. Well, so to like, be yeah. fair, the Terminator's kind of kicked his ass. Right, exactly. That one crossover, all, but in all, all fairness, <laughs> so much like saying elsewhere, this whole giant part of the Earth, you could divide it into quarters. <laughs> Much like a giant block of cheese. Yep. yep, it's all it's all in the snow globe being looked at by, a, by a young child. <laughs> That's and, a great reference. And <laughs> help. Well, it's just a very similar universe. And I've tried. Sure. Trust me, I've tried as much as I could to find so many other connections to Noah Bell. But, <laughs> You'll end uh, up with the the strings and the on the bulletin board. Yeah, who's the, the real puppet between, master? Yeah, but exactly. <laughs> I, I like a giant block of cheese because this shows sure. how cheesy all of cinema is. But. There's that, um, but I, I love I love the thing that early on in his career, Tarantino said that um, <laughs> the characters in certain movies are real people, and then the characters in other movies are just movie characters. And I <laughs> and I think what he said was, "From Dust Till Dawn" or "Kill Bill" or "Death Proof" are movies that the characters from Reservoir Dogs, Pulp Fiction, True Romance would maybe watch. So it's like yeah. those movies are movies in their so they're not connected, but they're movies in their universe. And I think maybe he laid off on that and he laid off on the interconnected universe stuff, although he does still love to reuse surnames and things like that. Oh, totally. Uh, yeah. And you'll drive yourself crazy just deciphering his alternate universe. You're like, okay. Absolutely. Yeah. I think it I think creators realize after a while that they've uh, painted themselves into a corner. But going back to the the bad guy aspect, insert all, crazy showrunner cough cough. Mm -hmm. um, yep. But I but back <laughs> in, you know uh, uh, going it going into the villain thing and thinking of like an interconnected universe of of villains, I always think about that about like if Hans you could Gruber and company take over the yes. place. And then, oh my god! Like and Hans then Gruber leading like, a team. I want that slice of yep. money too. Um, yeah, yeah. The the dirty dozen of eighties uh, bad guys, right? Yeah, Gruber would have to be the ringleader. He'd have to be the the Hannibal from the A team, basically. Oh, but, there you go. And right, hell, right. Could and then RoboCop actually <laughs> kill Hannibal Lecter for that matter? But 
Because of course Robocop could kill Hannibal Lecter. <laughs> I don't know, man. But uh, what's funny is uh, <laughs> there's all these other super villains who kind of have Superman type strength, but the yeah, hero yeah. is just basically somehow able to piss them off enough to where they reveal their yeah. uh, weak side. But maybe it, there's a whole there's a whole subgenre of serial killer movies in which the people made them seem to think if you're a serial serial killer that gives you supernatural powers. You're right. It's, just, it's set in the real world, but somehow the person can like turn Pretentious invisible. Plot and... twist not revealed yeah. in the last ten minutes. Therefore, I'm invincible until oh, yeah. battery life. Up. Oh. Um, yeah. But I love no Country for Old Men. I love all the Coen Brothers movies, but that guy only does all that stuff in that movie because everyone else is acting so stupid. Like the cop yeah. in the beginning has to keep his back to that guy the entire time to get to get, you know the drop uh, he's catching uh, them all on their worst day at right? all hours of the night yeah uh, and so yeah it is almost <laughs> kind of a as Hitch, that's their hitchcockian movie where it's like the most almost like even touch of evil it's the most anti right life movie ever um oh, i love touch of evil when i when totally. i think about the, when i think about all these those villainous characters we talk about though the best actors bring them humanity without subtracting from the villainy and that's what kurt wood smith does in robocop he it's he Clarence, finds he's just yep. dynamite it's hard to i can't even imagine this not being on his resume because he has impacted this so well but well this the 70s show kids all said that he was <laughs> just he was just a treat they would quote his movies they would quote um dead poet society to him all the time the part oh, where he dis wow. discovered yeah and they would say that uh i think it was topher grace said that kurt wood smith would just smile just, he's a terribly nice man and he's so he's such a good he's very much like gene hackman where he doesn't want anything yeah. to do with this stuff he vets that stuff as soon as he's done with the room he does he's not a method yeah. guy like all these other That's guys right. who live their he inner hell and you're like oh dude six months you don't want to do that yeah, to immersive, yourself. Uh, yeah immersive acting also like gene hackman he never says a thing that doesn't sound completely convincing and right? when i and when you think about that in terms of RoboCop, and when you think about how much of that stuff is improv and him playing around, and when you think about him being a nice guy in real life, and then you see the creativity involved in creating this malevolent character, it has the glee of a guy being like, well, I've never been an asshole, so let's try it out. <laughs> I think of two moments in that movie in particular that really, really just melt my butter in terms of like what I'm looking for from an actor in a performance. And the two, and it's, they're both improvised. So Kerwood Smith is watching Pearl, uh, Paul Verhoeven stage the scene. And mm -hmm. he's walking through the space, and he says, "And so you, I'm gonna not, I'm gonna do a version of an accent. It's not really his accent. I know that he's got a crazy accent, but but you come in and you and and you come in through here and you go there and bitches leave and then you and he's just directing and Kerwood Smith is listening, going bitches leave. So then on the take, he walks in and goes bitches leave exactly as Verhoeven said it, bitches leave, and that's where that comes from." And Verhoeven's like, I love it, I love it, you know, and that's you know, that's the whole thing. And then the other part, which is like that, is he has blood in his mouth, you know, because he's been beaten up, so he right. has blood in his mouth. Seen ago. And when they put the form in front of him to sign it, he spits on it, spits blood on it, and says, "I want my fucking phone call." Yes. And oh my god. I don't know if the line is a uh, improv, but the spitting the blood on the form definitely is. <laughs> oh, absolutely. It's kind of like the usual suspects where Peter Green, you know, Zed and Pulp Fiction decided, how about I flick the cigarette into Stephen Baldwin's annoying face? And <laughs> and that was not improv that was improvised, but it was just interesting just how it's yeah. like you can't imagine these improvisations without the movie because it's just yeah. it just shows yeah. you how the writer and director is only good, as good as their crew. You know, if everybody's not willing to play ball, then you get, it's like any baseball game. You know, you can yeah. have a great set of pitchers, but, and players, but if none of them connect with each other, then neither will the audience. And I, yeah, I, I gotta ask you out of yeah. all of Boddicker's men, uh, <laughs> Yeah, you know, so we got Steve, you know, the Chinese gunman who goes, ah, fuck you. We got Emil, yeah, yeah, yeah. the bald gunman, the, the motorcycle. Yeah, yeah shotgun cocking. Yeah, we, yeah. we got Leon, you know, played by 
Twin Peaks, you know, Ray Wise, and then we got Joe. The great Ray Wise. The great Ray a, Wise. Who I can gun. say from personal experience is an absolute gentleman and a class act. And yeah. A guy. yeah. I, I, Terrific he's guy. probably had the best career out of all these guys because he's found ways to, instead of just playing demonic characters, also just play yeah. everyday neighbors and what have you. He's funny on Fresh Off the Boat. Yeah, there's we got, some versatility there, yeah. And then we got Jesse D. Goins. Uh, you know, as Joe, who I, I love how this character is kind of both making fun of stereotypes kind of loosely yep. of yep. African-American characters, while also a real militant. He's like a... Oh, God, you have to wonder, because there was that stretch of movies in the 80s where it seemed like every crew had a high-pitched laughing, like just a black dude with a high-pitched weird laugh. It's like, why was that a thing? Lawrence Fishburne and Death Wish 2? You know, it's just like, why, yeah. where, where does that come from? Oh, so, absolutely. These are, is he making fun of it? It's great. It's like <laughs> This came out the same year as Lethal Weapon, but like literally all these oh, wow. guys are kind of like, if anything, RoboCop is very much a more successful 48 Hours, where D'Souza, uh, the diehard writer, was trying to add all the humor for Eddie Murphy, and Walter Hill wanted a serious, gritty cop thriller. Yeah. <laughs> The that push and pull, yeah, yeah. But it is, yeah, I, I, I'm i always surprised each time. It's like, surely there's a Joel Silver connection here somewhere. But yeah. Um, uh, yeah, it's it's those guys' sensibilities. I think if anything, somebody like Joel Silver or, or even somebody like Bruckheimer and, and Simpson, what they're really bringing as the producers is they're bringing a, their sensibilities. They're bringing what they want to see in movies. Mm -hmm. So if a guy comes in and says, that's great, let's make it funny, let's make it big, let's make it sexy, let's make it, you know, it's, when you have that kind of enthusiastic encouragement, that's the direction you'll go, as opposed to a producer says, let's bring it back, let's ground bring it. Bring it back, y'all. Yeah. yeah, come on, everybody. So I, hey, like, I don't know. <laughs> but in that same way that we're talking about with RoboCop, what I really love is is finding that balance where you can have quiet moments and loud moments because movies, you know, movies are like an album, you know, they're like, yes, uh, bef before, before you get 5,000 points. <laughs> Thank you. Not that they matter. We're not playing, well, just playing but <laughs> uh, before the kind of franchise filmmaking in which movies became big episodes of TV shows. And you're just like, you're, you're watching the next episode in the ongoing series. <laughs> there was a time period where you know, movies, it was like, conflicts will be resolved in two hours you know or maybe they won't like it's a five harder on deep exactly. space <laughs> it's, yeah, it's yeah. what it's one of the reasons why i love going back and watching the oeuvre of, of one filmmaker and like just going through all their movies is because you see an evolution in the, the kind just of like a music they artist did they 100 encompass yeah. the whole album or did they just have those free hits and the rest yeah. was b-side type nope nope ignore there's a joke with some of my friends that Jack only likes bands have been broken up for 30 years. Uh, so, but the reason is because I like being able to look at a body of work. You know, I was listening. And that's where you on... retort. Then show me an artist who's naturally evolved instead of being over marketed nowadays. Well, I can't and think then, of any. well, also when I signed on to Amazon Music the other day, they're like, pick uh, at least three bands. And I'm like, I see one. I don't like any of these. Yeah. And you're like, come on. And then you realize, okay, there you go, Prince. And I like selected Prince and that was it. But there's there's that quality of, um, there are so many movies being made right now and probably more than ever before. I mean, obviously before the strikes and everything, but there, there's been a glut of movies and TV shows. There's been a glut of quote unquote content. Right. And the thing is, is that when all content starts to resemble each other, that's when everything gets lost. You can't keep up with it. Yeah. Exactly. I love being able to follow that through line of, you know, a filmmaker, a storyteller, a company, you know, whatever, whatever the hell it is. And I like being able to follow that line and it creates its own little channel and channel by which I mean, almost like coming off of a river, you know, it creates a little channel that I can follow mm -hmm. that I can swim down. And I can actually make sense of this rather than like, Oh, hey, let's watch a movie tonight. Now, should we choose the entire universe? <laughs> everything, everything that's ever been made? Ah, you know, there's there's something to be said for um, the diversity of entertainment being not just like genre based, but also like I want to I want to see something that's kind of cold and hard and will leave me feeling a little drained. I want to mm -hmm. see something that's life affirming and makes me laugh. And like on different nights, I want to see all kinds of stuff. 
I showed my girlfriend a courtroom thriller the other day that she had never seen. And when it was over, I said, so what direction? Like, we had more time to hang out. We were just hanging on the couch with the dog and the cats. And I was like, yeah, right? It was a you know, happy family, all five of us. And and I said, after this very cold adult courtroom drama from 1989, 1990, um, I then said, so do you want to put on like a silly comedy now? And she said, I want to go colder. So we kind of <laughs> kept going in that direction. So it went from sort of a courtroom grown-up thriller to like a like full-on life is horrible kind of thriller, you know, mm-hmm. just the where the happy ending is that um the the good guy shoots the bad guy and sells their soul in the process, you know, like all that kind of stuff. Oh my god, what and, movie is this, dare I ask? I'll just I'll t- I'll give you a list later because there's so many movies. Oh, about, oh so because I mean, I just saw the Kane Mutiny by William Friedkin. Oh, sure. the other oh day. did you watch that? Yeah, I told thousand percent recommend. The camera just loved all these performers, and yeah. it hit homes on the emphasis of the book alone. Previous versions, which is that it makes us reaffirm what we do in all our workplaces. Is your boss a psycho, sure. or is he just bad at his job? It's a big ass difference. That's pretty interesting. Or yeah, is he both? That's pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah. it, and and where do you where do you draw the line? Where do you say I Bingo. don't want to be the person blowing the whistle? Where do you where do you say this who's is acceptable? The guy and this is versus unacceptable? Who's the one and culprit? That's right. Yeah. Uh, well, but the original given the, movie, the tracky the... of you, uh, who's the engineer versus who's <laughs> the red shirt? You know. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. From I just got here. There's oh. something. <laughs> <laughs> we'll return after these messages. If you like small town mystery, crazy news, and wild history, then the Florida Men on Florida Man podcast is for you. Each week, Josh Mills and Wayne McCarty bring you the absolute best Florida has to offer. So if you're looking for a show that's safe for the family, but funny enough to help you escape everyday life, then listen to the Florida Men on Florida Man podcast. That's Florida Men, plural, on Florida Man podcast. Hey, it's Brent Pope, the host of Breakfast with Brent Pope. You've seen me on some of your favorite TV shows saying things like, give it up, Jimmy. You got to sink this putt to win. On Breakfast with Brent Pope, I sit down with guests from the entertainment world, and we do it all over breakfast. Or should I say breakfast? Every week on Breakfast, you get inside Hollywood info and tips, great breakfast wrecks and booty debates. Most of all, you get the most delightful 30 minutes of your week. So dig in. It's breakfast time. Listen at breakfast.com, Apple Podcasts, or wherever fine podcasts are found. The Jacked Up Review Show podcast is honored to be part of the Blind Knowledge Podcast Network. Join anytime, talk the talk, and enjoy yourselves. There's something enlightening for everyone with this crowd of cool cats. Check them out. Uh, You have a last name, Guy. Do I? Um, (laughs) Guy. What a guy. So there's, I mean, there's something we, there's something we said too for all the stuff that we're saying, and we're, you know, we're swirling around a little bit, but like yes, we the, are. The we're a old, pop culture of this. But, but the, the overall principle I think is you can tell when somebody cared about it versus when somebody is just trying to do something, bingo, and imitating something that came before. Oh, totally. And there's, and there's nothing wrong with derivative as long as you invest it with. Everyone an idea. should see these RoboCop sequels and just look at the good parts. Like you can right. be let down by the plots becoming less satirical and more of a Happy Meal toy ad, but you can still enjoy <laughs> RoboCop's big ass gun and jetpack and flamethrower. Yeah, and- what are you looking for from a movie? Are you are you looking? It's like I remember when the Last Jedi ended, and I turned to my girlfriend and said, "Wow, they finally made a movie that everybody's gonna like." And it's like, whoops. <laughs> yeah. And the reason I said that was because I was like, "Oh, look, it was a unexpected, innovative kind of story." grafted onto all, all these familiar things everybody loves oh it's gonna get this audience and this audience what a great marriage of sensibilities <laughs> oops i shouldn't have said anything yeah, but, the problem but is <laughs> i think robocop didn't want to be a toy commercial but the company wasn't right. in on that joke while star right. wars was definitely designed to be a gi joe transformers thing and how Absolutely. ironic their toys yeah. are by hasbro so <laughs> yeah yeah or, or kenner right right which uh, is now I, a hasbro I remember all story. <laughs> yeah i remember all those kenner toys i had most of them and then also uh 20th century fox kicking themselves over that deal they made um oh the- hell how about <laughs> what's his name um 
Oh, who did Titan A E, Rock and Doodle, and Oh, uh Don Blue? Yeah, how ironic that he tried to escape Disney and now all his shit that was owned by yeah. Fox is now owned by Disney. Oh, it's insane. That would be and a total that... F you to me. I'm like, I'm trying to escape. Well, and then, you know, uh, a friend of mine made the most recent Hellraiser movie and the executives who were, you know, who were visiting the set were Disney executives because it went. Oh, really? To, yeah, because it, it went to Hulu. It was a Hulu. I, uh, I, I love uh, Jamie Clayton in it. I thought she oh, made the role her she... own. Like that regality. Yeah, she was. I'm already a fan of hers. Like if you see her yeah. on the L word or designated survivor, you're like perfect, very yeah. laid back more. But then unleashes this performance where you're like, where did that come from? Because no one else yeah. can give you that kind of role. And I think that's kind of like on your Boddicker point is like these sure. actors are they're literally taking out their robotic sensors. They're scanning the perimeter and yeah. then deciding I'm going to go here and there and then do well, this. And look at how indelible an inhuman performance can be. Because you you mentioned Terminator a few times. It's like, so Arnold Schwarzenegger as the Terminator is such a, an yeah. incredible combination of Van actors. Damme would have overthought this and wanted to give right. him a Cajun <laughs> accent. Uh, Dolph yeah, yeah. Lundgren wasn't ready yet until right, he became right. a serious <laughs> guy. And Seagal would have just given you nothing to work with and just said, can I just beat someone up and be yeah. a sex trafficker on the side? You know, it's just... But I'll, yeah, but I'll also say, yeah, that. sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. It's okay. Um, uh, I, I do, we do reference real life criminals here, guys. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, People who should be shot in the dick. Parental guidance is uh, suggested. No, I, <laughs> yeah, <my dear. laughs> and, ja and Jamie also, I'm not even suggesting that Jamie had the sort of limits as an actor that, that Arnold had at that time. Uh, it it for me it's more like the way in which Jamie is, was able to play an inhuman character. I told Bruckner that like the movie basically just stops dead when she's on screen and like your your <laughs> heart stops. And it's that quality of it's the same thing that Doug Bradley did in the first movie of like this is a person whose concerns are beyond our understanding, and mm -hmm. has that like he had that kind of bored aristocrat kind of quality. Jamie, I just remember the moment when she says um. Uh, when the guy basically reveals the double cross and Jamie goes, interesting. And this really, in this intonation, I can't even do justice to. Uh, and also the design of her makeup and the design of, of her as Pinhead, uh, which, which uh, you know, my, my buddies did. They, they found a way to sort of make this, like, it's like, if nothing else worked about that movie, holy shit, she worked. <laughs> You know and that character works if anything it's trying to be kind of like all these clyde barker comics where it just kind right. of goes through the nightbreed world and then i mean if anything this is how pinhead should always be he is a guest For star sure. he's not yeah. the main antagonist he's yeah. just kind of communicating the very much like final destination in a way where he is communicating uh that death has plans for the characters in the room <laughs> Yeah, and and I think she rivals Doug Bradley, and not least of all because of that, by coming in and and you know as a trans woman and and someone who who has more of that quality of uh, completely non-binary. Once you take away her her hair and her, se and her sexiness and her you know her her natural beauty her and voice, once, once and... you cover that up, yeah, and the voice is is at a specific timber and all that sort of stuff. It becomes it becomes somebody who exists outside of gender at that point too, which is what the Cenobites would have been in the first place, right? And this is how we gotta do to make a impact, dude, because you see so many people yeah. who are still being progressive roles, but then they still when they're in a sci fi or horror movie, they go back into the stereotype of that character must now be a victim or be killed and it's like, well or or be do any good. Such or be treated with such kid gloves that it almost <laughs> becomes like they're not, not they're not even in this movie because we have they're a plot you know, device versus exact, or, or we're worried about the political implications of everything this character does so we have to that's actually what i really loved about the new evil dead rise is uh they did oh lovely well how they there were two there were two children in there whose whose gender were not really defined and uh, in the family and they were treated like anybody else in a horror movie, and they were given the dignity of that, you know, mm -hmm. of being either a victim or a monster, as if anyone else would be. And it's just like there's something to that, as opposed to as opposed to underlining it and saying, "Here it is," and here's the statement we're making. It becomes, uh, "Oh look, 
these people are people too. And if they were in a horror movie, they'd be people in a horror movie, like, you know, like people are. <laughs> so I, anyway, and that, and actually one of the things I really do love about Evil Dead Rise, which I, a few of my friends really love it. A few of my friends really hate it. And I had a great time with it because I think any movie with Evil Dead in the title should be bananas. And that movie definitely the right kind of bananas though too because you see other people trying to emulate it and it's like yeah but yeah are you in on your joke or is it like maniac cop or wishmaster where you can take it either (laughs) serious or campy depending on your shotgun you know oh my god a grindhouse there you go well that's what it is are you hope with a shotgun or are you mandy you know like (laughs) there's different you can those are in a lot of ways, the same kind of movie. And a lot are you of ways... The Exorcist or are you <laughs> Sharknado? I don't know. <laughs> well, that's an interesting leap. Um, no, <laughs> that's I... a leap of faith, baby. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but I feel like, you know, in, in all the stuff that we're talking about, it's like, what's my favorite Evil Dead movie? Evil, Evil Dead 2. A lot of my friends, their favorite is the original because they like the grimness of it and they like that it's such a straight up horror movie. I did not particularly like the Fetty Alvarez Evil Dead And I really liked Evil Dead Rise. I meet people who are the exact opposite opinion. And it all comes down to what I was saying before. What are you looking for from your movie? Do you want to be surprised or do you want to have your expectations fulfilled? Do you you want the movie to be something that never would have occurred to you? Or do you want it to be exactly what would have occurred to you? (laughs) Do you want to see the characters do only the things that you like and take away all the aspects of things you don't like? Do you want a push (laughs) and pull of dramatic tension? All of these questions. go into when you make a movie you have to shut out any any expectation at all except the one that you have as a filmmaker who is also a film watcher (laughs) so all you can do is say well what i would like is and then that's what you do (laughs) because if you do anything else then you're trying to predict it's like trying to engineer being popular you know right this will make them like me. And then you're just like, when, when has that ever worked? We all went to high school. When has that ever worked? Tell me, Cam, when has that ever worked? Uh, I, I can't think of any. No. <laughs> it's like, this will make them like me. Pig's blood, the end. <laughs> that's that's it's what just that's... as bad as force feeding the plot in addition to all the expo <laughs> dump. It's just... I yeah, mean, assu- yeah, assuming the audience is dumb too. It's, look at it's Jones, too. played perfectly by Ronnie Cox, and in uh, the old man. I mean, those guys could easily yeah. be plot devices. I mean, yeah. by bar two, the old man is literally a plot device. He could be replaced by any other guy in a suit, and you wouldn't tell the difference. But Ex- and- yeah, those are good actors too, and and sometimes it really is uh, is the filmmaker capturing what they're doing. Verhoeven they're, is the kind of actor who is look able at today's to- Wall Street, how it's fell to change, sure. and these guys fell sure. to change all the time. They just want to have a bunch of dead bodies later. I mean, these are the kind of guys you can literally do metaphors for all the other assholes in the world who are testing out products on pets or just putting other shit in cereal that's going to give your kid, you know, cancer, you know? I had no idea you're such an activist. I should have researched you did your podcast. There's a lot of social commentary (laughs) here in these movies, you know? It's almost almost a cousin of the stuff, you know? Mm. (laughs) What's in your food? <laughs> yeah, or you know, or Dawn of the Dead, the way that the Dawn original of the Dawn, Dead, the original Dawn of the Dead in particular, those I like commandos, yeah. especially in part three that they send to evict people from their houses. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's an imminent domain. Uh, yeah, those are literally the same shoot on sight assholes in Blade Runner and Dawn of the Dead. I am convinced. Yeah, <laughs> and that and that too. They're the Demolition like... Man cops. <laughs> oh my God, Demolition Man! Like when I, you have the right to be frozen. <laughs> I saw that in the theater <laughs> and we had, a, we had a blast. Yeah, no, I was, I turned 45 this year. I was born in 78. So by the nineties, I was going to see. I applaud you, dude. Oh, thank you so much. But here's the other thing. I, I was going to see R rated movies in the theater, probably when I was like a 10 or 11, I remember seeing who Jonathan you? Demme's. Yeah. I remember seeing Jonathan no, who Demme's. Brought you? Oh, who brought me? Oh, I thought, Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you gave me an Irish toast. Um, uh who brought me i think it would depend if i was with my little brother my mom would just drop me off and we could get tickets that was the thing this is outside washington dc this is northern virginia and this would be in the uh uh, it's fine yeah it's fine (laughs) i remember seeing married to the mob the jonathan demi movie in the theater (laughs) with my little brother 
and uh, Nancy Travis is the first naked woman I saw in a movie theater, like projected on the screen. And then years later, uh, I talked to a friend who was working with her and she said, oh, I have to introduce you to, she would love to hear that, you know, something like that. And um, <laughs> so that was 1988, maybe it's the movie he made right before Sansa Lamb. So maybe 89, maybe 90. So I couldn't have been older than 13. And I would have to look it up, see exactly when that movie came out. And nobody, nobody stopped me from buying a ticket. I bought a ticket to Nine Realm Street Five. You know, that was '89. <laughs> and um, so hit. Yeah, it was just. I mean, you could say it was a different time, or maybe it was the area I lived in. And there was the multiplex down the street uh, up there in Alexandria, Virginia. And we would go to those movies all the time. And I went to Pulp Fiction and bought the tickets myself. And I would have been fifteen. I was sixteen years old. So. Um, yeah, so we we went and bought tickets for Pulp Fiction, my best friend in, in high school and I, and we were 16 years old, and we saw that movie on Friday, and then we saw that movie on Sunday at a matinee, and we saw that movie on Sunday night. That's the one of the few movies I can think of that I saw in the theater three times over. Holy week. shit. And all three times, just me, 16-year-old, no, no adult accompaniment, and I turned out fine. <laughs> I mean, we all have it. We... <laughs> I I'm don't not even know. twisted at all. But by the time, by the time you're a teen, you might as well let people do what they want. But now, there are certain movies you probably want them to avoid, like more graphic war films or stuff that's just going to give them too many nightmares. But at the same time, you're going to yeah. see some of these movies modified on TV. Or I, I don't know why parents are even like, "Oh, you can watch something violent, but you can't watch porn, or you can't watch this sure. R-rated yeah. comedy." It's just like, well. It's all the same. It's just a matter of, it's like yeah. playing a video game. Are you playing it with other people, or are you playing it by yourself, where you have no reference point and are going to start you're, doing socially unacceptable? You're absolutely. You're hitting on what I think about it because, like, <laughs> yeah, in isolation, because that's the thing. I wouldn't watch violent movies and say I can't wait to do this in real life. You know, I was watching yeah. violent. I was watching violent movies as sort of an exorcism of my own violent fantasies. Bingo. It was the dark playground I could play on. Some people don't have that, and I credit my parents with giving me a moral context to apply to all of my life. So mm -hmm. it became it became less about we have to hide these ideas from him and more about we have to let him know what's important so when he's hit with these ideas, he'll be able to... And then that's that's the other part of it, too. Uh, take a big step back. <laughs> yeah. And I, I quoted my mom in the, this book that I that I contributed a couple of chapters to. I quoted my mom as saying, I even wrote in the book that she would deny ever saying this. And then recently she's like, no, that sounds like something I would say. <laughs> um, I you remember her. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I remember her saying to another parent in front of me, I just don't want them seeing these stupid, violent movies where the good guy is the guy who shoots the most people and all that stuff. She didn't want us to see <laughs> Schwarzenegger. You know, she didn't want us to see Bruce Willis and Sylvester Stallone. That's the stuff she didn't want, want us to see. She's like, I just hope my children go through their entire lives without ever killing somebody. Pause. But I do hope they eventually have sex. <laughs> so my mom <laughs> didn't care. Stop. She, she wasn't she wasn't trying to <laughs> encourage us to watch sexually explicit stuff but i do remember her not exactly it's good education stuff. it gives you good ideas she didn't encourage it but she <laughs> didn't necessarily uh police it so no. there were there were moments and in that same book i quoted this at least you had where, some kind of dialogue because i see other people some who, kind of dialogue yeah uh, now i see people who are just plain bad parents like they just want their kid to watch a stupid cartoon and not ask them questions while they have time off from work i'm like see that's just you might as well just have them looking at that cell phone and you're not even in the room because that's not interaction do you have children i do not i do i don't i don't have any nephews and nieces and yeah yeah you know i love i love my my nieces and my nephew but we all my brother's realize... getting married next year so he's doing something hey right. congratulations one less um, loser in the family <laughs> <Anyway>. <laughs> my my brother's gonna get married soon as well my my uh, younger brother kudos to your brother but, um, yeah thank you so much but kudos also... to you you're doing something right um, hey, well, yeah, no, I, I just celebrated my sixth year anniversary with, with my my <laughs> lovely partner. Yeah, high five, and she's and she's the best. But um, hey. the but the uh, we have to realize that we are absolutely um um armchair coaches when it comes to criticizing how people are raising their kids. We're the guys at home on the lazy boy telling, hey, if I was coaching that football team, it's like, <laughs> yeah, we have no idea what it's actually like. We should not be criticizing these 
we can we can say you and I can say you know what's wrong with these parents, but we should maybe just keep that to right. We shouldn't do it on a podcast, is what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be unfiltered at the bar after we win the game. There you go. We're, yeah, you're such a bad parent. Your coach is more of a dad than you ever were. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're playing. They're playing the best game that they can, and then we'll hit the bar later and be like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, uh, game, I don't know. Baby. I don't know about the team oh. this year. <laughs> did you see? Did you see how the one kid was doing in Taekwondo? I don't know. So anyway, so <laughs> just let's just pull a cigar where we just give them the black belt just because we're having a bad day and we want them to go away. Two cigar references in one episode. Uh, you know, he, he needs to be shot in the dick. Um. <laughs> Cheers, man. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> um. So. I would have liked to have seen uh, what's his face, uh, that one asshole. Um, uh, the various Japanese androids, uh, the Otomos. Uh, I think yeah. they would have been perfect villains, but unfortunately, yeah. they're mixed with red shirt DNA, where they're very bad at slicing and dicing with a sword, even though Robocop's not getting up yeah. right away. So that's the that's the robot ninja in the third movie. Yeah, Rip returns the main executive. There's a lot oh, of missed opportunity so... here. Yeah. I gotta ask. I know Fred Decker a little bit. I gotta ask him about working with Rip Torn. Um, there's, <laughs> there's Hob, yeah, because... the R-rated kid, which was a mystery oh. to me growing up because I saw RoboCop two on TV, so I didn't realize. Oh, yeah. Gabriel Damon, that one Star Trek guest star. Oh, he's he actually curses in the movie, and yeah, everyone else I, is on drugs. <laughs> I remember reading the comic book of RoboCop two, and his dying words were, uh, "You know, you know what it's like to die, or whatever it is." And RoboCop says, "Yeah," and he says, "It really bites." And then I watched the movie and he says something completely different. And that was because I was reading the PG rated comic book that then was the R rated movie when I finally saw it. Oh yeah. And I think if I think back to Robocop two, which is a perfectly fine movie, it's just one of those sequels that it unfortunately is following a masterpiece. And it's a little bit like when you remake a masterpiece and you're, it's like I mentioned the Dawn of the Dead remake, which I like very much. Yeah. But it's a remake of a masterpiece. Uh, the Thing mm -hmm. prequel is a perfectly serviceable creature feature if you're not comparing it to John Carpenter's masterpiece. Well, it's even wilder which, how that one's yeah. up. I kind of do the Magnificent Seven slash High Noon slash Seven Samurai mentality, Love where it. they're all variations of the same thing. I mean, The Thing itself is already a remake of The Thing from Outer Space, you know? That's right. And where do we... But when we think about that, the Thing remake in no way is following the footsteps of The Thing from Another World. It's taking the same source material and recontextualizing it and, and creating a new idea. And then The Thing prequel is step by step following in the footsteps of John Carpenter's The Thing. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of the difference. That's why The Fly, the 1950s sci-fi Vincent Price, The Fly, um, yeah, that's a fun movie. David Cronenberg remakes it and it becomes a modern a different chapter. Yeah. Exactly. So but I like the Dawn of the Dead reference. I mean, that's kind of how I am with Evil Dead yeah. 2 as a director's cut of Evil Dead 1. The new sure. Man, the Living Dead from 1990 was again just yeah. doing yeah. different uh, setting and restructuring of Romero's original cult film. So it's just like, yeah, as long as, I mean, Look, look at either version of Suspiria. As long I as... love both versions of Suspiria, and they yeah. make a great double feature. Oh, and you brought up the new Hellraiser. Same deal. Yeah. They're doing yeah. their own vision, so it is almost like watching all five versions of Blade Runner. You can That's ship, funny, pick and yeah. choose which one you want to... I mean, we talked about Touch of Evil. I mean, there, there's so many different movies where it's just like, it's a whole different thing now that you add these extra scenes and this different context. I mean... yeah. I can't stand any of these new Disney movies because it's just an excuse to keep the license going. But I will give Maneficent <laughs> credit because it was a good. It was different. Had, yeah. It was it the was, simplest was... thing in the book. Do yeah. I mean, just just like if you were to do Hi Die Hard from Hans Gruber's perspective, yeah, do this fairy tale from the villainous perspective instead of oh, yeah. goody goody two shoes is going to stop all this CGI dark magic. And it's like you you gotta. <laughs> have a voice instead of just look like product placement or just again yeah. a happy meal i was just saying to somebody today that uh there are certain movies that if you told me that they had been created entirely by ai including the performances i would have been like yeah no that tracks and i think the live action <laughs> disney remakes fall under that rubric 
they fed the original into the movie as opposed to the new top gun which is just like beat for beat top gun it's the original movie beat for beat but it's one of the most well produced incredibly uh, uh spectacular movies ever ever made just from a just from a, a, a staging and production aspect holy shit what a ride that movie is i but couldn't script, do a recruitment ad but i know what you mean you know what i mean but then <laughs> that's the thing the top gun maverick or maverick top gun i can't remember the order it goes in top gun 2 maverick top gun 2 maverick they, <laughs> it's like they fed the script for top gun into a computer maverick. <laughs> yeah and then the computer spat out maverick so in fact up to and including the fact that i think there was a glitch where um john ham's character it feels like he's fighting to not say turn in your gun and badge <laughs> there's that one oh scene. i thought he was just trying to say when do i get to fly with you <laughs> well, i'm in love with you, you. right oh oh god you want to go back right. to tarantino man come on it's yeah sword it's fire. my Messenger uh, is his car porn top gun yeah. is air porn yeah there you go sleeping with uh was it sleep with me sleep, sleep with me has... give me your scientology babies huh? yeah <laughs> Quinn Tarantino uh, doing an extended monologue in the movie Sleep With Me in which he does not have a writing credit, but there's no way that he didn't just come up with that entire thing himself. <laughs> I don't know how not, yeah. This, yeah I miss have... those days when it really was just film your friends at a party with their permission I... and talk to their agent later. Oh, for sure. And I, Well, a couple of movies were made that way that kind of didn't work. Like I remember Noah Baumbach made a movie uh, called Highball that he took his name off of. Oh, oh yeah, you, it was like yeah. leftover footage from one of the other movies he made in the 90s. And it's like, why did you or, do that? <laughs> actually, no, that's you bring up a good point. I didn't even think of that because all the cast kind of cross over. So I think yeah, it was like from I, High Life kind of. Yeah. Yeah. And and um, uh, Mr. Jealousy and those movies, all the movies he made pre Squid and the Whale. So I think that it was maybe the rap party was they were filming like little sketches and stuff because it's it's like horrible high key lighting. And then there are jump cuts. <laughs> there are actual jump cuts. So you know that they just pieced this movie together. He took his name off it, but I don't think spitefully. I think it's just because, hey, this is barely a movie, so I'm not going to give myself credit on it. But yeah. That, but that's what it is. Like, that's sort of at the tail end of Our the filmmakers, 90s. Indie. man. You're too close. Well, but the 90s indie boom, that which is when I was in high school and college was the nineties. I went to, to high school, 92, 96. Yeah. College. When people say indie nowadays, I'm, I just shudder. I'm like, no. what do you mean? Well, but yeah, exactly. It's like, by it's indie. not the indie today is not the same as nineties and eighties. Yeah. Well, it was always more of a brand, right? Because it mm -hmm. becomes, this is Disney's indie arm, you know, With digital it's, now, right. <laughs> it's just shot on a phone yeah. or digital and nothing against that. I'm just saying, but it's a different kind of indie now. Cause now that, the difficulty also, of affording film is gone. You have one yeah. less barrier. Yeah, but if you can make a great movie shooting on a phone, if you can make a tangerine and or put something, it on Tubi or Prime, do it. Yeah, for you know, yeah, for for the love of God, do it. You know, make a movie. Just means... do it. <laughs> exactly. That that is what I was doing when I I started my career borrowing cameras and uh, shooting movies on the weekends, and just I didn't have a crew. I, it was me holding first, me holding a camera. Then me holding a camera and a boom mic when I realized, oh, sound is important, <laughs> and all of that stuff was that was the by that was the the methods by which I learned how to be a filmmaker was by just grabbing a camera and, and making a movie. I didn't go to film school, and <laughs> nice. there's well, but that's but that also is like everybody does it differently because everybody learns differently, and if mm -hmm. you go to five different film schools, you'll learn a completely different methodology of, of filmmaking. And it's because everybody does it differently. You find the way that works for you. Don't ever so, go to the snobby ones here in Texas. I had no. <laughs> a few different ones who were like, oh, don't make anything like Star Wars or Tarantino. And don't sure. make anything with zombies because you can't, quote, relate to them in real life. Well, I'll tell you. I'm like, my, having not gone to film school, I believe that what film school is is a tool like everything else. And what they give you, you then have to work with as a tool. It's not about slavishly following the rules. It's about knowing what the rules are so you know to break them. You know when well, to I break mean, them. You know when to follow them. When you were telling me about uh, policing earlier on, it's oh, kind yeah. of all this alone with Robocop here. It's interesting how... <laughs> uh, it, it, my, my father would always ask me when me and my sister were done with school. It's like, okay. Did you attend or did you learn anything today? 
And this is right. a good it's a good uh thing to ask yeah. yourself each time. Just just like how you value your time and money. This really is like, nice. well, yeah. did you No, I didn't learn shit today, but I passed the test so I can get on to the next level. So it's just like you know, just always ask yourself in hindsight, what am I gaining? <laughs> Sounds like it also taught you self respect. Because wow. I, I yeah. there's because there's something to that. There's something to it's funny because you mentioned that I worked for a police department. I worked for a college police department, you know, that people will call them the squirrel chasers. And you and obviously, it. yeah, and obviously being a policeman or working for the police has been recontextualized and, and just recently culturally and, and politically. But there's something to what I just said about film schools. It's also police departments. Go to five different police departments, you'll find five different, completely different philosophies on law enforcement and what you learn and i think what you learn overall Bingo. the more the more people you encounter the more you learn that everybody's had a different experience there's no one way that is the way everything is nuanced this is the way. way right yeah anybody telling you that is probably a cult leader they're probably a uh, nazi <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> i stand by my original statement a cult leader so <laughs> <laughs> Nazi cult leader. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, no. That... <laughs> Run away. Oh, we're getting into a weird area, Texas. You say? <laughs> oh, oh uh, you... and, 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 so the uh, mention your state and then at, end it with a Star Wars line. I'll, I'll go first. Okay, Dallas, go ahead. Texas. You will never meet a greater hive of scum and villainy. <laughs> Outlaw town here, baby. Um, That's pretty good. Okay. Los Angeles, California. In my experience, there's no such thing as luck. <laughs> <laughs> and you win the internet. <laughs> Fucking hell, that's great. Mm. That's great. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I listen. I feel like um, all of this stuff, too. But what I love about having this conversation and tying it back into the genre movies is that even genre movies, I feel like, have to come from a, a place that feels honest and connected in terms of life and the human experience. He said as uh, he's drowned out by motorcycles. And uh, uh, I think he was, uh, Robo was shooting a mill off his cycle. Yeah, again. exactly. Bum, 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 bum. Okay, so even... <laughs> That's even a Captain Kirk intro fight song. The arena um, The The... Um, um, Sorry. Here we go. Here we go. Robo, Robo's Robo's revving. I, mean, I would think that was my friend Henry, but I know he's not in the in the state right now. He's going to um, the body shop late night. Um. Yeah. Um, even genre movies have to be somehow related to the human experience and can't just be derivative off of other movies. Mm -hmm. Being derivative is there's nothing wrong with being derivative. Just like something that's original doesn't necessarily mean it's good. And right, you know what. I mean, I have it's those the first arguments. to open up Pandora's box. It doesn't mean it's the one that got yeah. it right the first time. And I'll argue all the time that, that you know, it's on a case-by-case -case basis. Because I'll have people sort of argue with me and say, like, Green Day is a better band than Ramones. And I'll say, you're an idiot and need to <laughs> die. And just and I shoot them with my Robocop gun. No, but like, uh, but that but that whole thing. Limp Biscuit is not toxic. Uh, yes, it is. Um, <laughs> anyway, go ahead. Uh, these are all opinions. Um, uh, send, send, <laughs> send your letters directly to, to Cam. Um, no, but I. Yeah, sure. I'm, I'm the body shot. <laughs> I'm the M209's first target now. Um, it's your podcast. I'm just a guest. Uh, but the <laughs> but the way that I <laughs> the way that I see it is like there's nothing wrong with being derivative. It's just. Are you just imitating what worked in another movie, or do you have an idea about the way movies work that you can apply to this? Bingo. Movie? And I and I feel like, uh, and of course, execution. There's a term used out here in Los Angeles, which is execution dependent. Isn't everything execution dependent when you really get down? Always. To it? You can yeah. have the most incompetent cinematographer, or yeah. five different editors fired, or yeah. a director who pulled a Brian Singer and had the second unit guys come in and. Uh, rescue the movie so yeah that and, and, and whatever you get to work with is the movie everyone remembers when you said before that thing about you um like a director has to have a great team and then also that director has to lead that team like there are a yes. lot of different approaches to directing i'm sure you've encountered it plenty you know and we've all heard For the sure. same stories time and again where the scott had a vision and yeah. that was pissing everyone off and making them realize tough love and then there was spielberg saying hey my first movie, I fucking hate working on this movie called Jaws, but I'm going to just yeah. keep my cool and ease yeah. this out. 
at least I won't have to talk about this horrible experience for the rest of my life. <laughs> at least this won't make my career. Oh, <laughs> oops. Um, no, there's there's something to be said for. Um, I'm about to you can break. have an incompetent principal, but great teachers. So, well, and then you ha- and then everybody does it differently. But then you have to find the way to do it. And you're never going to truly win over your naysayers because no. every, all the assumed wisdom. Look at people, Joe Hodgson. He's being trolled sure. maliciously on Reddit. And I'm like, well, what do you care? No one's asking yeah. you guys to contribute to this crowdfunder. So don't. Yeah. And also. Being a little you, cesspool saying he fucked up MST3K. Duly yeah, noted. Can't. I'm going to support season that. 14. <laughs> there you go. And so am I. And you can't control. <laughs> you cannot control uh, public opinion. Never. You control. The reaction of things and then knowing that you can't control it it's like well then you just have to put put your shit out there and and trolls unfortunately want the same thing you want which is validation right. validation attention attention but then it just comes down to do they even want anything in re- really in return or are they just a soulless abyss of just shit storm you know it's just i just feel like everything's a symptom of the whole it's there's no... <laughs> there you go there's no we can't be utopian we can't go through and say no. i am selectively saying that this part of culture and society is good and this part is bad and the bad part needs to go away however like, unlike yeah. robocop we can decide who's an enemy and who right. we can't shoot at well sure i'm there's, just joking around but it's just seriously it's just there's so many people who will forcing do me to thing. take you seriously because you bring up these serious topics and i'm like yeah gosh he makes a really good point <laughs> we aren't robots Ta-da! Ta-da. No, but there, i but got there's... into exercise back into exercise <laughs> this year because there's this thing called insomnia but you can cure oh, yeah. it if you actually get off your ass and get active every day before work so bullshit i've tried everything <laughs> i believe you it's funny because last night I had I had terrible insomnia last night, and usually oh, when I have terrible, well, it's okay, but usually when I have terrible insomnia, it leads to me um, just having existential dread for hours until I fall asleep. And last night I cracked mm. the third act instead. And it's like oh, oh cool. I was like, God bless you, insomnia. Now I panorama. Have I'm ready. Script. Yeah. <laughs> that was, I'll see you at the next the, that, screenplay competition. Um, that's my title. That's uh, I'm gonna call Nanorama it. Incorporated. Perfect. Um, yeah. Bananarama. It's a Bananarama story. It's about that band. <laughs> oh, lovely. Yeah, I, I made I made them uh, parallel the Beatles. The Beatles are the bad guys in that story. I made that up. You know, just it's it's exactly like. Oh, this sounds like the next best thing since Weird the Al Yankovic story. I, I love these oh kinds God. of movies you know, that it's... mirror real life and then add a funny twist on the reality. If you compare the Weird Al story to what really happened, it's actually more truthful than Bohemian Rhapsody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, I just love just how it made fun of so many of those tearjerkers that became so Oscar bait at the end when he it ends with a tragedy. Spoiler. Yeah, it, it took him it, it took it one step further than Walk Hard. <laughs> oh my god. That's great. So, uh, so when do we start doing this? When are we going to start? Uh, uh, well, we'll, we'll get into the next part, but yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, as a whole, uh, if you want spoof villains done right, uh, y'all, it is definitely with the one, the only Robocop. And <laughs> glad that Jack got to be part of this chat. I yeah. am too. It's one of my absolute favorite movies. And it's Murphy. one of the movies that <laughs> in this household, if the question is asked, do you want to watch Robocop? The answer is always yes. And that's yeah, there's no, no second guessing it or thinking it. <laughs> I, my, my wonderful girlfriend and I have expansive tastes and we watch all kinds of movies. And yet, if either one of us asks the other, do you want to watch Robocop? The answer is always yes. Bingo. And I'm looking at my 4K steelbook right now. Oh, Where'd you go. Look at you, you beauty. I worked <laughs> hard for that 4K. Yes, I did. My own money. The Arrow Blu-ray is great because they got the TV edits. It was a special feature. Yeah, that's a, that's actually in the Steelbook. It's it's Perfect. Arrow put it out. And it's like a four disc, and it's got great the four K, got the Blu-rays. Oh, so so great, so great. Follow us on the web on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. 
The podcast is available on Podbean, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Anchor, Apple, and anywhere else podcasts are available. Feel free to review our show and leave comments on any of those sites. Thanks a million for listening. It's a jacked up review show. Show.